Good morning, Jesus Image family. How are we doing this morning? Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. You know, I was just thinking about we are in right standing with God. That's not a thing to take for granted. We just want to welcome everyone that's online. Thank you so much for joining us. You're in for a treat. The Lord is going to be here. And I just want to open up with Ezekiel 36, verse 24. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Jesus, we thank you that it's not on our ability, but it's on your ability. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood, Jesus. We enter in your courts with thanksgiving. We enter in your gates with praise, Jesus. We put thankfulness on our lips. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Be welcomed in this place, Lord. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
victory, my soul will rise to only bring you glory. With every breath that's in my lungs, my heart cries out to you belong the glory. And through every loss of victory, my soul will rise to only bring you glory. And with every breath that's in my
minutes just fill this room with praise every single voice Lift your voice a bit. Come on, worship the Lord. Keep singing, keep singing, keep singing.
Come on, church. This is your time now. Take it from the worship team. And be the saints of God. Step into your office as priests of the Lord and lift your voice to him. Keep going. Come on, stir up the inner man. Give Jesus praise. Lift your voice. Just let go. Surrender. Let your spirit sing. take our church into true worship. days coming where the team will not have to lead you in worship. So I want you to step into that river now and you sing that chorus. Come on, lift your voice. We give you. I want the church to lead now. Step into your offices. Just begin. your voice. Again, just lift it a bit. Again. We give you.
wonderful keep playing we give you this morning while I was praying I, I this picture kept flashing uh, before my heart of parents praying over their children and maybe your children aren't here with you or maybe your parents aren't here with you you can still hold them in your heart but if you're here this morning with children or your grandchildren I want you right now just to um, lay your hands on them make sure they're your own kids and um, if you'd like to stand in agreement with somebody else for their kids you're welcome to do that but I want you to begin praying for them and what I what I was seeing this morning was you declaring the word of the Lord and the plan of God over their life and I want you to, to pray big things so I want you to start now just just start praying 
I want Jenna and uh, Ryan to come up. You guys pray. You guys pray. Yeah, and you guys just minister to the Lord on your instruments. You guys grab a mic. Yeah, come, come stand close to me. Come on, Father, in Jesus' name, we just thank you for our children, and our grandchildren, and the generations. You are the God of covenant, the God of generations. And so right now, in Jesus' name, we declare your perfect plan over the generations to come. If you're believing for children, start declaring now. Father, I thank you for your plan. I thank you for a hedge of the blood that will protect our children, a hedge of the blood that will protect their minds, that you'd be the Lord of their life till the day they go home, and that they would never, ever bow or follow the world. In Jesus' name. You guys keep praying. Jenna, would you lead a little bit? And Ryan, I want you to pray when Jenna's done. Lord, we just plead the blood over our families and over our children. Lord, your word says that children and infants will give you praise. So we thank you, Jesus, for our children and for our generations. And we break all sickness. We break all generational curses. It ends with us, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for our families and our children and our household, Lord. Let them look at you even from a young age, Jesus. Give them the fear of the Lord. Give them the wisdom of the Lord, Jesus. Can we just lift up even our children, like Pastor Michael said, that aren't here, Lord? Lift them up on your lips and we give them to you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for our children, those of you watching at home. Just lay your hands on your children and say your children's names. And we thank you, Jesus, for our family, that me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we thank you, Jesus, and we give them completely over to you. Like Pastor John Bevere says, we bind our children to the cross. We bind them to the cross, Jesus. They will not know a single day away from you, Lord. And we thank you, Jesus, for our families. We give them fully over to you, Jesus, and we plead the blood over each and every one of them in Jesus' mighty name. Yeah, we thank you, Jesus, for household salvations, Lord. We thank you that we in our homes, we in our houses, wait, we in our wait, families. Right there, right. Wait right there. How many of you are believing for children to come to the Lord? So many of you. Okay. Pray into them. Go ahead. Yeah, Father, we just thank you, Come Jesus, on, church, agree. This is dear to the heart of God. We in our house shall be saved. Our families shall be saved. Father, we thank you for any prodigal son or daughter that is not home in Father's house. God, we pray by the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, that you bring them home. Father, I pray for sweet conviction to hit their hearts. Father, even now, in this moment, this exact moment, wherever they're at, Jesus, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you convict their hearts in a loving way, Jesus, that the love of God will cover them right now where they're at, that it will pierce their minds. Jesus, I pray for the hand of God around them like you've kept me my whole life. I pray you keep them, Jesus. Father, regardless of the mud pit that they may seem like they're in, I pray they are coming home in Jesus' name. We plead the blood of Jesus over them. Father, we thank you for the cross to become real to them. The blood that was poured out by you, Jesus, to be real to them. Father, I pray, God, where they're at right now, that they are coming home in Jesus' name. That we stand in the gap for our, our family. Father, we thank you for forerunners and trailblazers in this room for generations to come. Father, that the lineages of their lives and of their families will forever be changed because of their lives. We thank you for it, Father, in your precious name. Guys, this moves mountains. This will take our nation much further than watching the news. You want a generation to serve the Lord? Intercede for them. Come on. I want you to pray for the children in the children's church today. I want you to cry out. Come on, church. In your hearts. Thank you, Lord. 
Lord, I thank you for when I was eight years old when you touched me and you marked me, Lord, and I was never the same. And I just pray with that kind of faith that even right now in Children's Church that you mark them, Lord, that you grip their soul, that they'll never know a day outside of your presence, Lord. I thank you that revival is going to start with the children, that they're going to teach us so much about you, about the Father's love. They're going to teach us so much about what it really is to just trust Jesus, to just trust you. So Lord, I thank you right now that a weighty blanket of your presence will just come and cover these kids. We plead the blood over them, Lord, and I thank you that the destiny on their lives will be brought to completion that your will will be done in their lives and they will serve the lord Amen. thank you lord thank you for these kids what a blessing and a privilege it is to learn from them lord i pray that we learn even more as a church body that we observe the childlikeness that they bring lord thank you for their worship last sunday yes. in jesus name families listen up your kids are going to get their identity from the Lord in you or the world and Satan so what I want you to do right now I know you've been praying but something Jesse and I do with our children keep playing there guys don't change anything um, Jesse and I declare the greatness of the Lord over our kids when I was away from the Lord in college I would come home six seven in the morning and my mom wouldn't go to bed at night she'd stay up all night until I got home and, and, I, and uh, I remember walking in many nights and she'd be on this little chair and she would say you're going to come back to Jesus and not only are you going to serve the Lord back in those days my father-in-law's show would come on at 6 or 7 a.m. this is your day anybody watch it super early back in the day it would come on and uh, so she had nothing to do but pray and worship so she'd turn on this is your day and I'd still be out and when I'd walk in I remember one time I walked in and she said not only will you come back to Jesus and not only will you preach the gospel but one day you'll preach the gospel on that platform with Pastor Benny and I was like that's crazy what are you who's been out you know who's drunk <laughs> and and all I want to say is all I want to say is there's no prayer too big for God so what I want you to do is if your children aren't here, I want you to put their name on your lips right now. And as their parent, you step into an authority that nobody else has and it moves heaven. I want you to step into that authority and declare what God has shown you, your children will step into. Declare it and whether they want to hear it or not, it will fall like seed into their being and they won't be able to run from it. Go ahead parents, go ahead. You do it. You do it. Come on, declare it. I tell my kids every day, you are a man of God. You are a woman of God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Not a day away from you, Lord. Not a single day. Not a day. Thank you, Jesus, for your angels. Thank you for your blood. Jesus. Take a few more seconds here. Come on, pray big things that millions will come into the kingdom, that the sick would be healed, that their marriages would last, that they'd never know a day of serious sickness. As Jenna prayed, that all generational garbage dies. It stops here in Jesus' name. That their identity is in Jesus himself. Hallelujah. 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 Okay. Would you just lift your hands to heaven, everyone? Father, thank you for this wonderful sense of your presence. Thank you for every prayer prayed. And we as the church stand in your presence this morning and give our amen to what you've declared in your word. That as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. 
Now I want you to seal that with an amen. Say amen. amen. And give the Lord praise. Thank the Lord for our worship team. Amazing. I get the honor to receive this morning's tithe and offering. You guys ready to give to Jesus today? Come on, you guys ready to give to Jesus today? Amen. And I was, I was sitting in my chair and I was just thinking, like, we're here. Like, how thankful we have breath in our lungs. Like, we made it to April 24th, 2022, by the grace of the Lord. Like, I was just sitting there like, man, like, we have so much to be thankful for as a family. Like, we're in this room. He's put breath in our lungs. Like, it, yeah, I just think of stuff like that. I don't know. The Lord is faithful. But if you guys want to turn to Acts chapter 20. I'm going to read verse 35. It says, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Why is it more blessed to give than, it to, than to receive? Because the Lord is a giver. It's who he is. You know, and as we give our tithe and offering this morning, how many of you guys know, just like Pastor Michael has taught us, the tithe is the very first tenth of um, all that comes into our lives as far as financially. Um, and we get that opportunity. And it, all, and it also looks like we give that tithe back cheerfully. There's a heart posture that goes along with that first fruits. It's called cheerful giving. But our tithe and our offering is worship unto Jesus. What's beautiful is that it ministers to his heart, but it also reveals his heart because he's a giver. And every time that we give, whether we're giving on a Sunday morning as our tithe and our offering a Sunday night, or we're giving to the needy, to the poor, to those friends and family around us, that we're revealing the nature of Jesus. That it's a testimony unto him of who he is because he is the giver, capital G. We only learn how to give from him because he's a giver. And so this morning, I just want to encourage you guys that, man, you guys are all testimonies of Jesus. And the Christian life is a life of giving. And he modeled it perfectly by giving his son. Before we can ever give to him, he's given to us. He's led by example. And we, what we do as followers of Christ is that we give. It's who we are. And so in the presence of Jesus, this Sunday morning, as we gather and we really just worship unto him, worship doesn't stop. It continues. It continue, continues with the fruit of our labor, the sweat of our brow. On this side of eternity, we actually get the opportunity to give to him. Come on, this little time period called life, before we step into, we are in eternal life, but before we cross over, we have this opportunity on, by the fruit of our labor to give him a sacrifice of offering to him. It amazes me. For all eternity, we'll be giving to him. But on this side of eternity, we get to give, you know, I remember working really quickly just at Crazy Greek, and I'm thinking, in heaven, I'm not going to be working at Crazy Greek Kitchen. But on this side of eternity, I get to give Jesus by the sweat of my brow. Right here as I'm serving tables, man, I get to give this offering to the Lord. What an honor and what an opportunity we have in this lifetime to give to Jesus. So let's just pray. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity, the honor of giving to you this morning, Lord. Father, for you said it is more blessed to give than it is to receive because you are the giver, Lord. So I pray we give to you because we love you. We thank you. Father, we thank you that we're here today. That you've given so much to us, Jesus. We give directly into your hands. I pray you bless every giver in this room, every giver online watching. Father, you are so good. In your precious name, amen. If you guys are watching online as well and you have been, been blessed by this ministry, man, we invite you guys to give as well in this moment. We're gonna bring the buckets up here. Um, if you guys need an envelope, you guys could raise your hands. We have envelopes throughout the world, uh, throughout the world. Yeah, we have them throughout the world. 
throughout the auditorium. We have ushers throughout the auditorium that have envelopes in their hands that are willing to give it to you if you need one. So just lift up your hand as well. If you guys need to give uh, online, text to give is up there as well as you guys have a number on the bottom of your screens as well. Um, yeah, we'll be back in a few minutes. We love you guys. We'll see you in a little bit. I saw the Lord seated on his throne. Seated on his throne. Jesus, we love you. He was clothed in glory. He was clothed in glory. Exalted high. Exalted high. The train of his robe. And the train. morning. Let's give the Lord praise. Can we all stand, please? Come on, just lift our hands. Father, thank you so much for your 
amazing presence and for your word that is life and our food and our protection. We just thank you, Jesus, for hungry hearts this morning that come to you and say, feed us, precious Lord, feed us yourself and feed us the bread of life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord praise, would you? It's wonderful. I, I have one uh, announcement, and I already forgot it. I knew that much. I just don't know what day and time it is. It's this Saturday. Okay, this Saturday, and I love, I love that we're doing this outreach. Uh, this Saturday at harvest time at 10 a.m., we will be blessing people. We're going to be reaching out to the community, food drive. And um, for those of you who've wanted to do more in preaching the gospel and reach people, this is a great opportunity for you. So I assume you can just scan that QR code and register, and the rest is history. Um, again, we, we launched last week Jesus Image Missions, and if you have a heart for missions, we want you, how can they reach out, David? What should they do? You can, why don't you just, yeah, there we go. Text missions, there it is, to 321-320-8040. Would it be the same number on the live stream? Yeah, so if you're not here today and you're watching at home, you can do the same thing. But missions is vital. It's vital we give away what the Lord's given us. Amen? Amen? Okay. Let's get into the word. I'm really excited about uh, the season we're in. I was going to uh, teach on the resurrection. I'm actually finishing a book right now on the resurrection. I'm not trying to sell it to you. I'm just telling you it's on my heart. And I feel like there's a reintroduction that the Lord is wanting to give us of the simplicity of the gospel. How many of you believe that? We have an entire generation who thinks they've heard the gospel and have not. And the resurrection obviously is vital to our faith and to the gospel message Paul goes as far to say that our faith is futile if there be no resurrection. So the resurrection is key. It's key for the reputation of the Lord, obviously, who he is. It declares who he is, but it's a big deal for us. And it's so big that it has defeated the grave to the degree that we don't have to fear death. Yeah, somebody got excited about it. If you've ever been on, has anybody here been on what they thought was their deathbed? Anyone? Okay. Yeah, would you keep your hands up? Okay. Were you happy that the Lord defeated death in that hour? Yes. So this matters a lot more when it's you who is about to close their eyes. And so I'm going to continue the teaching on the resurrection next week. I felt this morning, as I was praying, I got up at about five to be with the Lord, and um, I felt the Lord change gears, and he began to give me scriptures. So I'm going to follow him. Our Jesus School students and some of you, some of our church family, will have heard me teach this text already, but um, it's not going to come out the same way. How many of you know that? The Holy Spirit has something fresh for us. So... I want you to turn to Mark chapter 4. And um, I want you to mark, <laughs> I want you to mark Mark uh, chapter 4. And... Um, We'll probably begin in verse 21 there. Now I want you to go in reverse, take a hard left, and go to Matthew 25. And we're going to begin in Matthew 25, 14. Um, do you, any of you ever have conversations with the Lord in your heart uh, while you're with him and not know it's going on while, until it's over? 
ever happen? Maybe you're like, I have a weird pastor. Um, for me, uh, over the years, one of the ways the Lord um, speaks to me is through showing me things prior to the meetings that I'm about to walk into. And sometimes they get really specific, scary specific. Uh, he's shown me people who would get healed on a specific row, uh, what they'd be wearing. And at first, I didn't know how, if I was hearing or not, and then I'd walk into the meeting, and sure enough, the person would be there. One time, I told my, my father-in-law, the first time I preached for him, I think, uh, I, I was staying over at their house in California. Uh, we had moved here, but I had flown out to preach for him on a Monday night, and I, I started praying like at six, and the meeting was at seven that night. And uh, I think he wanted to like check on me. He's like, is he okay? Uh, why hasn't he come out of his room? But that's just the way this whole thing got started, and I'm grateful for that, that it was birthed uh, in, in secret. And I told him, uh, so I'd spent the day with the Lord and we were on our way to the meeting. He, he was driving. And I said, I had the weirdest thing today. I, the Lord showed me something. I saw this quick picture of a lady wearing um, a certain color blouse. I think it was like a deep blue or something like that. And the Lord's going to heal, heal her. And I, 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 she was sitting. I, I was just learning. So I was like, I think she's going to be on the second row to the left. At least that's what I saw. And so he was like, that's amazing. So he opens the meeting <laughs> by saying, my son-in-law thinks he heard from God. <laughs> I'll never forget it. And then he's like, he says there's a lady <laughs> with this uh, colored blouse on who's going to be healed. And so I'm scanning that row like, oh, Jesus, please be there. <laughs> and... To, to, at first glance, I didn't see anybody with that blouse. I was like, oh, jeez, wow, I'm, I'm really off. And the lady jumped up. She goes, it's me. She had a blazer on. She took the blazer off. It was the exact same thing I saw. She came forward, and the Lord healed her. So the Lord, is, he started doing that with me, where he would show me what's about to happen in the meeting I'm going to walk into. And it was such a gift and a blessing. Uh, one time uh, in Switzerland, my driver uh, or a host, I should say, sweet lady from Ethiopia. She came up to me and, and uh, after she, she gave me vegan lasagna, which is sinful. <laughs> I'm like, what in the world? Is that even a thing? So she, she's like, this is vegan lasagna, it's great. And I was like, mm, mm hmm <laughs> I wanted to honor her, so I did eat it. But I still wouldn't say it was lasagna. It was counterfeit. So she said this to me. I forget. We're, I'm eating the lasagna. She goes, did you know there's no demons here in Switzerland? <laughs> oh, really? None? And she goes, no, I haven't seen. No, not none. They don't, I don't think there's any here. <laughs> and I'm like, well, what keeps them out? Are the, the mountains or what, what are you depending on? <laughs> she goes, yeah, I'm from Ethiopia, and they're everywhere there. But there's none here. And prior to that time... Uh, in our services, a lot of people would get healed, but there wasn't a whole lot of demonic manifestation, which is real, by the way. We don't glory in it. You still have to know how to handle them, and it's not as hard as you think. But if you don't live a holy life, they know too. I'll just say that. Uh, so as I'm eating, I thought, I had this flash in my spirit, and I was like, tell her, you'll see tonight. And before I said it, I, had, I could see it in my heart. And I said, I, I, didn't, say, I, 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 didn't, I didn't say, you'll see tonight. I said, well, just show up tonight. And uh, so, obviously, she had to. She was my host. And you would have thought every devil in Switzerland showed up to one service. <laughs> and she looked at me while I was casting them out. I was walking down in, in the aisles, and she looked at me, and she goes, I think we do have them here. <laughs> And I said, yeah, you do. Clearly, see, that's not normal. <laughs> and so today I felt the Lord do that. I felt him throw me a, a little curveball to change what I had prepared months and months ago. 
And so we're going to follow the Lord, amen? And we can trust him. Okay, Matthew 25. And before we read verse 14, it's, in, it's, it's vital you understand the context here as Jesus is teaching on the ways of the kingdom. And prior to verse 14 are obviously verses, this is high level math, verses 1 through 13 are addressing the wise and foolish virgins. So when the Lord says something, it's really important if you want to get closer to him, that you understand when he said it and what he said or did prior and what he said or did after. Does that make sense? It's bigger than context. Context is important, but it's bigger than that. It's a matter of intimacy. Nothing the Lord says or does is by accident. So what I would like to submit to you is that the schedule of the Lord in the Gospels says something to us about him. Does that make sense? Um, If you want to see more healings in your life, go deeper than just trying to believe that it's real. Figure out how he stewarded the moment what he addressed prior, what he said after. Can I, can I go a little deeper? I actually had this conversation with the Lord today. I want to give them real depth. I just don't want them to throw up. Like, I want to throw a prime rib at you today. Can you trust me to throw at you? Throw it at you? Most churches don't do that on Sunday morning, and I just feel like we have to break out of that. Most churches have this thought process that give them crackers in the morning and then after they're with you 10 years on a Wednesday night, you can give them the depths of the scripture, which is why Christians are just getting smoked by today's culture because there are no roots of the word in them. So can we, can we take a risk today and actually commit to go deeper in the Lord's word? Paul said, look, you're still on milk. And what he addressed as being milk would be considered super deep today. Baptisms, laying on initial doctrines, all of these things. But I I want you to chew on a a choice meal this morning. So can we go for it? Okay. Jesus speaks not just through what comes out of his mouth, but he himself is God speaking. He's the declaration of, of the Lord. Hebrews 1, 3. He's the express image of God, the very brightness of his glory. This is the Lord Jesus. So it's wise to follow his life and pray pray into what you're reading and ask questions like this. Why did he only allow so-and-so around him when he did this or that? It'd be wise for us to say, why was there even a need to multiply food? And if you get these answers, he amazes you even more. And if you allow him to amaze you, a life of worship erupts in the heart. Does that make sense? The deeper you go in the scriptures, the higher your praise will be. That was better than your reaction. The deeper you go this way into the scriptures, the higher your response and praise will be. You stay here, You stay in the shallow end, your praise goes about 10 feet high. But the word is meant to reveal the Lord so that we actually have a response and respond to his worth and his majesty. And so studying the Lord Jesus Christ, let me make this very, very, very clear, is to study God himself. This isn't like studying Uh, Jeremiah well Jeremiah is great but to commit to praying through the scriptures to see here's an answer actually the reason he multiplied food is because you ready the people were hungry and and then you have to ask yourself why were they hungry 
Because they followed him into the wilderness. So that says something to me about him. It says that if I'm faithful, he'll take care of me. It also says this to me, that he's aware of my need. It also says this to me, he doesn't need a whole lot to work with to provide for this massive need. 15,000 meals, if you include family members. 15,000 meals. That's a massive fish fry. (laughs) How many fish would it take to feed everybody sitting at the Amway Arena? But he works with a little. That tells me something about him. I don't need everything. I just need to put what I have in his hand. I'll stay out of that shadow there. I can tell the team's wanting me to stay in the right spot. You're welcome, Yolan. (laughs) Why did the Lord kick a family out of a house to raise their daughter? Would you do that? You're like, oh yeah, I would. Not as easy as you think. I've done that. And you're not exactly the family's hero in that moment. Years ago, I was at a church here in town. We were just attending church. And the hearts of the pastors were so kind and sweet. And they were like, look, one of the girls of our church, she's four years old, I think, or three at the time, she had an aneurysm and her head is swollen. It's like the size of a grapefruit. And she's at, uh, I think, Florida South. I, I, I'm not, I think Jesus' image had just started. And I was sitting there in the chair, in the church. The church was pretty good turnout. And I got stirred up inside. I felt the Lord stir me. And they prayed from the platform, which was great. But I felt the Lord stir me and say, are you going to stop there? Well, I said, Lord, I don't know the family. And I'm not a leader here in the church. He said, well, walk up to the pastor and ask if you can go to Florida South today. So I did. I wasn't an elder. But I was like, we can't just let her die. I said, we can't just let her die. 20% of you believe that. Pretend it was your daughter. I'll say it again. We can't just let them die. Somebody's got to get a little agitated here this morning. You have Easter hangover. I think you were glorified last week, and now you're all hungover from drinking so so much. A good Friday, and Friday morning, or Sunday morning, Sunday night. Jesus is alive today, all right? Shake yourself up out of it. I didn't come here to massage you. All right, don't worry. I said, we don't just let them die. So I said, hey, pastor, can I go? He goes, you'll have to get permission from the parents. I'll call them. So he called them. And uh, they said, sure. So I walked in. The lobby was beautiful because it was for kids. It was really a, a gorgeous facility. And there was a man I'd never seen before. My dad was with me because when you walk into those moments, you look for agreement. I hope you're learning. I said, I don't have a team back then. I don't have a staff. My dad will roll with me. I said, Dad, you ready? Want to go see the Lord touch this girl? He goes, I'm with you. So I walked in and I saw a stranger standing between the lobby and the ward for the children. And uh, I said, what's the diagnosis? And I'll never forget what he said. He looked at me and said, miracle or death? I was like, oh, okay. And then we crossed the boundary of that door. We walked through the door and into the ward, and it, was, it went from like this beautiful thing to just sick kids everywhere. I'm in every room, a suffering sick child, intensive care, parents wondering why their child, parents broken up inside, wanting to know what's going on. And so I walked into that room and there were like six people in the room and it was the darkest feeling. 
Well, something I want to establish here in this church is that, and I want it to forever be established, is that yes, God can turn horrible situations for the good. Yes, he can. Say amen. It was, I, I'm one, I'm, I'm, I can share this testimony with integrity. I could not figure out why I was not getting well, but I had to trust the Lord. And he did a deep work in me. But the Lord did not give me a polyp. I gave me a polyp, polyps. I did that. It was not the Lord. And when you walk into a room like that, you have to know God sent you. And <laughs> side note, if you plan on rebuking something, you have to determine what you're rebuking. Because if you think God did it, good luck trying to rebuke him. This is so simple theology, and I don't know why the church has it so confused. So I walked in, and I felt this boldness come over me, and I could not believe what I said. <laughs> I, I can't believe it. I looked the family in the eye and said, I'm so sorry for what you're going through. I drove all the way here as a servant of God. I came here to watch God rip the claws of Satan off this little baby, and if you don't think he can do it, I need you to leave. That's what I said. And then I thought, what did you just do? And my dad was like, he didn't leave my side. But I could tell he was like, whoa. You're the shy golfer kid. What happened? They sat up real quick and they go, no, 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 we believe. I said, okay, I just need to say one more time. I'm about to pray. And how many of you know we should expect a result when we pray? That's what Jesus taught. It may not be what modern day dead theology teaches, but Jesus taught us to believe what we pray. Right? So I didn't know what to pray because I was shocked by the sight of the little child. I, I, the child's head had swollen up. It was, it was rough. So we just started to sing. We started to sing Alleluia because I was too nervous to remember any other song. And that had enough lyrics that I was able to, the right lyric amount that I could actually remember. <laughs> One word. <laughs> so we joined hands, started singing over the little child. And when we started singing, I, I, I took my hands away from whoever's hands I was holding and stretched my hands over the little baby all plugged in, tubes everywhere. And I felt a breeze blow <laughs> under my hand, and I thought, that's odd. I thought they turned the vent on. And as soon as I felt the breeze, those machines started reacting. So I jumped back, because I'd never been in that type of circumstance, and I thought I had stepped on a wire or pulled something out of the poor child and I actually apologized. I said, I'm so sorry. I don't know. I, I, I guess I did something. Uh, maybe I stepped on something or pulled something. And they said, the parents said, no, 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 no. Don't stop. Don't stop. That, whatever's happening, those machines are reacting. And those are, those, those are signs of improvement. Keep going. So, so I went home. I'm sorry. I went home. And the next day, I got a phone call. I was meeting with a pastor, and the, my, the person on the other line, one of the family members said, Michael, uh, uh, my sister, the little baby, went home yesterday. She said, within 20 minutes of you guys worshiping, again, not us praying, though that's fine, of you guys just worshiping. The baby started breathing a certain amount of breaths. I don't remember the breath, the breath amount, but I know it was within like 20 minutes the baby started breathing on, it, on her own. And the baby went home. Yeah, give the Lord praise. The point is, 
the point is, if I didn't look at the life of the Lord Jesus through the scriptures, not through my own perspective, I would not have known what to do in that circumstance. But I only knew this, remove doubt and find somebody to agree with you. That's what happens when you don't stop at the surface of the text. Okay? So it's important to look at this text in verse 14 and say, what's the Lord talking about prior? And the whole context is the return of the Lord. Wise and foolish virgins, if you look at Matthew 24, verses 45 through 51, the, the, the text is about the faithful servant and the evil servant. Verses 36 of, of chapter 24 through 44 are all about nobody knowing the day or hour of his return. So in the same breath, the Lord is talking about the end of the age, and now he inserts, I want you to get this, the parable of the talents. I want you to look at verse 13. Ryan, grab a, grab a mic, will you? I'm going to save my voice here. Can you read verse 13? Matthew 24. Sorry, Matthew 25. 25? Mm-hmm. Starting in verse 14? Verse 13. 13. Okay. Watch, therefore, for you neither nor the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. How many of you would say this is a second coming context? Yes or no? Okay. Now we move into the parable of the talents. And what I want to submit to you today is that as the Lord's return approaches, more and more people will sell their birthright. because of fatigue and desperation. Why did Esau sell his birthright? He was hungry and tired. Now, I'm, we are the church who tells you every week, life is just about loving Jesus. And it is. I would rather you sit at his feet in purity than fill stadiums in mixture all day long. But the time will come <laughs> if you're truly at his feet, you're going to discover about six feet above his feet, he has this thing called a mouth. And from his mouth comes a sound that is called his speaking. If you seek his face, you will eventually meet his words. And what will happen in that moment is you will discover that to truly walk in his presence in secret and in public, you have to obey what he says. We want intimacy to sound like lattes and journaling. <laughs> With your little Jesus image beanie. <laughs> but that's not the way the Lord receives love. How many of you read the five love languages? Okay. I have one that didn't make the book called Obedience. It's a great book. Don't, don't get me wrong. But to the Lord, love looks like obedience. To the Lord, love looks like sacrifice. The opposite of 
sacrifice, which flows from the heart of the sacrificial lamb, may I add, it's part of his nature, is selfishness. We think selfishness means I just don't give money away. <laughs> but that's a minute piece of this puzzle. The core of selfishness is Michael. Me. What I want to do with my day, with my minutes, and with my life. Does that make sense? It's me. It's Michael. It's I don't want to do that, so I don't do that. That's called Satan. The author of the selfish life. If Satan wrote a book, the title would be Me by Lucifer. <laughs> the deception sets in when you spiritualize your disobedience. Welcome to Jesus School. This is what it's like every day. So if, if you want this every day, just come. That's where the deception comes in. It's when you spiritualize the disobedience and start to think that, yeah, it's about you, but it's about you in the name of Jesus. It's the antithesis of the nature of the Trinity, which is to exalt the other. It's funny to me, the Lord didn't come as a, <laughs> you know, a bald eagle. John didn't introduce him that way, or a great white shark. We're all into the lion thing. That's mentioned a few, couple times, but that's not the narrative of the text. The narrative of the whole Bible is a lamb is coming. It's interesting to me that he comes as a lamb. I mean, I've never seen any athlete get a lamb tattooed on their shoulder. <laughs> well, do you want your center, if you were a quarterback, to have a lamb on his shoulder? or a big bear. I want the guy with the bear on it. Right. This isn't exactly the type of animal that makes me want to conquer the world. But in the kingdom, lowliness and gentleness destroys self-exaltation. I preached on the cross Friday night. What does the cross say? Die. And I realized preaching this on, the sun, on a Sunday morning, maybe many pastors would say, big mistake. You're going to lose people. Welcome to the ministry of Jesus. You may walk out, but this message is going to harass you until you go into the ground. That's my job, to protect your soul. I think we've had enough teachings on how to do you, how to be you, how to lead. Yeah, that's important, but let's lead like Jesus. Let's bleed. This is how you pick your 12 and your 30 and your 72. And you're 120, and this is what you do. Oh, yeah, you forgot something here. He died for them. And he prayed all night before he picked the 12. And I don't hear that in a single leadership teaching. Spend nine hours on a mountain. Throw the resumes out the window and ask your father who is right for the job. 
<laughs> right? That's... That's the context in the intro. <laughs> Verse 14, we finally got there. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately... He went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one, I wish the universities would teach this passage, he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money I don't know if you notice here, it's not the person's money. It's the Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Not the life coach of those servants. The Lord. How many of you know when you got saved, yes, Jesus became your friend. But the scripture teaches us to confess him as Lord that word Lord in the New Testament is the word kyrios. In Greek, it means you bought me. You bought me. How many of you have ever had a gallon of milk that you purchased talk back to you and tell you when you're allowed to drink it? <laughs> so or uh, I need boundaries. It's like, no, dude, I bought you. You're mine. Now, boundaries are important, but we can glorify those as well. And we end up trying to create a utopia for ourselves that is called self. It's the Lord's money. Now, the, this teaching is not about finance, but it would apply to it. And after a long time, this is speaking of the ascension, he has gone up and will return, and the space, the amount of time between the two. I don't even know Jesus went up and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. Between that moment and his return is this amount of time. The Lord of those servants came and Settled accounts with them. You think tax season is thorough. It's funny, you know, the judgment seat isn't going to be all like lightning bolts, there will be, but there's actually going to be a diligent accounting that takes place. If you want a good accountant, you want to stay out of jail, you want to find a meticulous accountant. There's no more meticulous Lord. Than Jesus. Verse 20, so he who had received five came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. This man had the most to start with, right? Yes or no? Yes. And even though Jesus cherished what he gave him, when he addresses him, when the man brings his 10 talents total, the Lord says, you've been faithful over a few things. To the guy, he's like, whoa. 
Here's a treasure. You've never seen such an offering of life. Here, the Lord goes, you did good with just a little bit. Now you get a lot. Verse 21. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter in to the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Same reward, even though he brought less. Get this. This is where comparison dies. Same reward. It's not about how much you start with. The question is, did you steward it? You're rewarded not for the exact amount. You're just rewarded for the multiplication that comes because of stewardship. Verse 24. Am I boring you? It's going to get way more boring. (laughs) Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. Reaping where you have not sown. In other words, I knew you to be a thief. And gathering where you have not scattered seed. Don't miss this. And I was afraid. I'm getting louder, huh, babe? I was afraid. I was afraid. Good. There, that sounds so much better. Thank you, Lord. And went and hid your talent in the ground. Look there. You have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You poor little baby. No, really. You poor little baby. You, oh, you wounded little soul. I'm just trying to find that. Oh, yeah, there it is. You are so busy running errands, you just couldn't make it happen. No, don't say that either. You wicked and lazy servant. Who wrote the Bible? Say the Holy Spirit. Did I write it? No, I'm just reading it. You wicked. See, we think wickedness is a Ouija board. And it is. (laughs) But that is not the core of it all. We have to let the Lord determine what is evil and wicked. You say, I work hard. You might be working hard on the wrong stuff. You say, I'm a great steward. You might be a great steward of you, but not what he gave you. Listen to what he says here. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. He's saying, look, maybe you don't got it like these other two who can invest it and, 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 and see it multiply. But couldn't you at least put it in the bank? I mean, I don't know if you've checked the interest rates lately during tax season. How many of you figured out you didn't make a whole lot in your checking your savings account, right? The Lord's like, I would rather you have made the $8 over the last three years that the bank offers than hide it. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him, this is the person who wasted it and hid it, and give it to the one who has 10. 
Oh. For to everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Oh, it would be better and easier on us to stop there and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Then again, you look at verse 31, he sandwiches it with his soon coming return. Why would he teach on the parable of the talents directly in between, dead smack in the middle of end time teaching? I believe it's because of what I said earlier. Many will sell their birthright as the coming age comes to an end. I should say as this age comes to an end. Something I learned a long time ago is that I'm replaceable. Proof of that is that the church doubled in size when I left because of my voice. It's the Lord who builds the house. And the Lord doesn't only build the house. He's the substance that he builds with. That's what he told Peter. Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then the Lord instituted how he would build. Upon this rock, upon that revelation that I am the Christ, the son of the living God. So that's the substance. If you're wondering what the brick and mortar of the church is, it is the person and nature of Jesus himself. But he doesn't stop there. Yes, he's substance, but then he goes on to say, I will build it. So he's the builder and the material. Does that make sense? When you understand that, you realize, yes, he loves me, but he's got 10 sitting the bench waiting to get in. That's the scriptural narrative. And he doesn't have an anointing deficiency. It's super sad to start believing that it's your anointing. No, you're leasing it. His anointing. You're the vehicle. And he's got a big supply. And he can remove that anointing and then trust someone else. Even if you keep your gift that is without repentance, when you remove the anointing of the spirit and keep the gift, your gift gets smelly. Because there's no protective anointing. The anointing carries the fragrance of Jesus. So it smells beautiful, but nothing is more gross than watching someone gives, who gives words of knowledge and sleeps with chicks on the side. That's what happens. More than you know. Making sense? Yes. Too much for Sunday. Okay. Trying to help you. As Bishop Jakes would say, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. This is just the beginning. And the Lord takes it, and it would sound more palatable if the Lord gave it to someone who had less than what you squandered. But he doesn't do that. Government does that, but the king doesn't. And how many of you know, in heaven, there is no voting him in or out. He's not moving. He's on an immovable throne. See, it's very, and these texts are meant to go, er, er, and reveal what's in there. 
And before you leave him, I would just like to encourage you to say, I don't like that. And guess what he's going to say? I'm not changing it. So what he does is he takes what you squandered, even though you had a little, and gives it to the person with the most. Which sounds really unfair. But in the kingdom, God rewards the person who can be trusted most with the most. So when you steward responsibility in the kingdom, he gives you more responsibility. Now revival history will write it out like this. God just picks a few people and just uses a few people. And everybody else has to sit in the chair and be a spectator. No, 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 no. Yes, a few people have a lot of fun in the kingdom. But that's not by accident. It's those few people said yes to him a lot. And he gave them a talent. And it multiplied. What does sickness do? It shuts you down. What did the virus do? Shut down and brought havoc. What should you do financially in those times? The opposite of the nature of the attack. So when the world hoards, we give. Amen? The world is afraid of death, we laugh at it. The world punches their enemy back, we say, please hit me again. The taste of blood is glorious and you can't beat us. That's the kingdom. It's so much different. So much different. And what the devil does is he loves us. Can I have five extra minutes this morning? Nobody ever says no. You're allowed to. Just don't scream it too loud. Just send an email in. Carla will read it. <laughs> the devil loves to write letters that we believe and sign Jesus at the end of the letter. Oh, Jesus did this to me. Jesus wants this of me. No, you want it for you. 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 You, yourself, you, 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 you. All about you. You want this for you. And the tragedy comes when we blame our suffering on Jesus. It's not, it's not as spiritual as you think. It is and it isn't. No principality gave me a polyp. I talked too much. It would be very convenient to me to blame a demon. Because that wouldn't require a lifestyle change. That wouldn't require correction from my pastors. I have been corrected at a level you cannot imagine to the point of being called basically dumb and hypocritical. Now, I don't agree with the last part, but I needed to get spanked. Even if you get a wrong spanking, we need the spanking. It's what Jeremy talked about. Because I can always respond in a godly way, even if they're wrong. And even their wrong spanking softens my heart which is true spirituality. But I'm not sure. I, I honestly, I don't, I don't think we get the lens that Jesus looks at our laziness. I think, I think we think he just sees it as, it's just, well, they're just a little lazy. 
But he didn't say that. He said it's wicked. Now you're not talking to someone who didn't take a nap. He took a nap on the boat. But if we're going to see, if we're all going to step in to what God has for us corporately and individually, we cannot bury our talents. And I don't mean, when I say talent, I don't mean, like, what's your talent? That's not the context here. It's actually... How many of you know you don't deposit rollerblades in a bank? It's just... He's talking about money. Because if he doesn't have yours, he doesn't have you. I don't like you talking about money. You don't like Jesus. Now here's the rough part. Well, there's a lot that's rough here in this passage. Is that you're going to be there. When the transfer happens. When he takes your one that you hid. And gives it to the guy with, or girl with ten. You're going to have to watch it. And what I would submit to you today. This might be out of context. But it's still a kingdom principle. Is that you'll watch it while you're here too. I've seen many people squander what God gave them. And they had to watch someone step in. And step into more. But what's the root of hiding? Think Bible. What's the root of hiding? I was afraid. And went and hid. Fear and hiddenness always go hand in hand. I hid your talent in the ground. Look there, you have what is yours. Look back at verse 24 and then I'm going to close. He who had received the one talent came and said, listen to this, Lord, don't miss this. Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. Reaping where you have not sown. And gathering where you don't scatter seed. The root here is thinking you know the Lord. But you don't know the real Jesus. It's having a vision of Jesus that's not true. I knew you to be a hard man. A brutal taskmaster, basically. And then he goes on to say, you reap where you don't sow. What? What an allegation. My vision is so off. I, so, I see you so improperly. But you, heaven's seed, you, the seed of Abraham, you, the pure one, the sinless one, I see you so improperly, I now consider you a thief. You steal people's dreams. If I give all to you, you will. That's where the fear came from. It's after that that he says, I was afraid. It's an improper vision of Jesus. The one who came to lay his life down and die. Why would the Savior ever destroy you? There are so many 
better preachers than me. So many with more radical faith. So many people who understand church planting better than I do. So many songwriters who are better than me. So many who are more gifted, who have more talents. But I've watched day in and day out people see him improperly. And then they cocoon themselves and squander what he gave them. And all I've tried to do is stay at his feet and say yes to the best of my ability. Well, Lord, I don't want to do that. He goes, I know, but I'm the Lord. I bought you. I know, but can't we just have intimacy? Uh Uh-huh, after you do this. And I'll increase the intimacy because you said yes. Because to you, this is shallow obedience, Michael. But to me... They that love me, obey me. This is love to me. It's a task for you. And what he does is, is you come in and you you get down on your knees. You're there in prayer and you wait. And you wait and wait and wait. Nothing comes. And then all of a sudden, you sense his presence and you wait again. You just stay there because it's life. And all of the sudden, maybe it's 10 minutes in or 10 hours in or 10 days in, whatever it takes, he speaks. And you discover that his speaking carries life. He said that. My words are spirit and life. So there's life in his direction. They're not empty commands. They are life filled commands it's almost like the Holy Spirit carries the capsule of his command and direction and fills the capsule with his presence and life so when you receive the direction you're not just doing the right thing you're receiving life and you come alive as you steward that and give him your yes don't miss this I'm speaking to you by the spirit this morning As you steward that and stay with him long enough, he will eventually ask of you what discomforts you, what interrupts you, what agitates you. And the command will bring you, listen carefully, to the end of your self-sufficiency and your normal, natural ability. It's like walking a plank. You've seen those old pirate movies. They push the guy out, and he walks so slow. His hands are tied, and he keeps walking the plank. And that's what God's voice is like. With every direction, you take another step on the plank. And we're so afraid of the unknown that is the ocean. But his voice is meant to do that. You think Moses was excited about delivering a nation as a stutterer and having to face Pharaoh who wanted to kill him? You think he was like, this is exactly what I wanted for my life. (laughs) But would we all agree that if Moses says no to the voice coming out of the bush... He's never going to see the glory for the tabernacle. Yes or no? Would there be a tabernacle if he says, I'm just going to stay right here as a shepherd and be faithful? Oh, it's just about faithfulness. I want to be faithful and simple. And here's the worst one. Hidden. When God wants you to go, hiddenness is a sin. You are speaking to the man who does not like crowds. If you want to make me happy, drop me off in in a golf course or the woods. Not this. I love you, but this isn't my natural makeup. But there's something about showing up and saying yes that fills my soul the next morning when I'm with him. Him. 
And so what I would submit to you this morning is intimacy with God, listen carefully, releases his word to you. When the word comes and you're faithful with it, intimacy increases. It's a beautiful cycle. If you say no, your intimacy is roadblocked. And what I've seen in, even in our, some of our students is in those seasons when they roadblock themselves or people I know and love, they start mustering up their own thought process and think they're having true dreams and visions. And so rather than obey the scriptures, they're led by dreams and visions that are self-induced. That are real, by the way. I just had a very prolific dream. I believe in it. But there is a way, there is an economy in the spirit that is biblical and one we can trust. If you want to express love to Jesus, yes, a song can work. But if you want your songs to catch fire in heaven, you have to give them your heart and your will. Amen? I want everyone to stand. I recently had a dream. I, I, I thought it was, uh, I knew it was the Lord, but I took it to the leaders in my life and <laughs> I thought they would all go, oh, so deep, that's amazing. Every one of them tested it. I could see it on their face when I was telling them. They weren't like, whoa, do this. They were going, and I could tell, after you do this for a while, I could tell, and these are all men and women you'd love, that you all listen to. I could tell, as I was sharing the dream, that little Rolodex was spinning. They're looking for signs of the word in the dream. They didn't buy it right off the bat. It had to line up with the scriptures and what the Lord has called me to. That's what we need in our life. Amen? With every head bow and eye closed, we're going to I know I went a little over today, but how many of you believe this was needed and that we all need to hear this? Okay. I guess what I'd say this morning is if, if for the first time you want to come to Jesus or this word triggered you to a fresh surrender, without any shame, I just want you to come down right now. You just come down and you say, I, I, I want to... Yeah, you can. You give the Lord praise. You can say, I want to, I want to, I want to freshly yield my heart, my life. Maybe many of you, I feel this strongly, many of you were called to do something specific for the Lord and you've squandered that. I want you to come as well. I don't want you to leave here and, and not repent of what the Lord deems to be wicked. Some of you, it was something very simple. To other of you, it was a ministry. Some of you, it was a church. It was a call to the nation. Some of you, it was to do this or that. I don't know. But when I read that and I heard the word wicked, I thought, I think you see this much differently than I do, Lord, and I need you to rearrange my vision. Yeah, you can come down. Don't worry. We're in no rush. We're in no rush. You come down. I think it's wicked to be bound to a clock. Come on down, yeah. And the Holy Spirit's moving on many of you. We'll wait. I'll never forget uh, my father-in-law sharing a story with me. It was at one of Catherine's meetings with a lady from their church, and they were watching all the miracles happen as Catherine was preaching, and the lady started sobbing. And he said, why are you sobbing? And she said, I used to do that. He said, what? She goes, I used to have a healing ministry. I used to do that. But I said, no. Maybe that's you today. 
Maybe the Lord spoke specifically to you about things that you've squandered and hidden. I want you. You come down. And church, let's receive them with love. Come on. Receive them with love. If I feel like there's some, some people here who've the the process to step in to what God has called you to seemed too long. It was too long. It was too thorough. It was just a long process. And, and you kind of bailed. And since then, you've, you've been hiding because the process is just too thorough. Come, you come forward. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Get back in the river. Get back in the river. I want us to be the ones who don't sell our birthrights as the Lord's return comes. I want us to be the ones who, who are cut the most open and say, have more of me in, this la in these last days. Look at all these people. This is awesome. This is awesome. Thank you, Lord. Look, they're lining up in the aisles there on this side. See, this is the Lord's work. This is the Lord's work. Some of you committed to raise your children in the presence of God and you've gotten lazy. You got lazy. You're no longer opening the word. You don't pray with them anymore. You come out. You say, how is that a talent? A life is a talent. If preaching is a talent, your child's life is considered a talent. You come. And in moments like this, the only thing that would cause us to hide is to see him as a hard man. Is to not know him. The whole point of this is to see him rightly. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for what you're doing here. And, and, and as I start praying, if you feel like you need to come, you just come. Deliver us from us. We can trust you to take care of us. You're the shepherd. And so, Lord, we confess our sin this morning. I just want us to pray this out loud, especially some of you who've come forward to meet Jesus for the first time. I just want us to confess this out loud. This is our faith. Heavenly Father, forgive me for living for me. Forgive me for seeing you as a hard man. You are a good father. You sent your son to die for me. And so today, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Keep me. I'm sorry, Lord. Jesus, I believe that you came to the earth suffered and died and rose again and that you're reigning on high and that you're returning find me faithful when you return not wicked faithful not lazy but sober looking at you obeying you loving you and walking with you Come into my heart. Fill my life with your presence. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, can we get them communion quickly? We're all going to receive before we leave. This is... Yeah, just keep playing there, Joel. Emma, can you come? Just help Joel. Let's remain standing for communion. Those of you who are being touched by the Lord up front or in your seats, let the Lord touch you.
Thank you, Lord. I want you to just say this out loud. Say, Father, you love me, and I can trust you. Say that again. Father, you love me, and I can trust you. One more time. Father, you love me, and I can trust you. Has everyone been served? If you haven't been, would you just wave at me? Okay. Let's take the bread. Jesus, we lift the bread of life, and we thank you for being lifted on the cross. And we ask you, Lord, forgive our sin, cleanse us. Cleanse our motives, our actions, and our hearts. Thank you, Lord. And Jesus, as you were lifted on the tree, you said you'd draw all men unto yourself. And so we break the bread today because your body was torn. And we say thank you for the blood and the body of Jesus. Cleanse our lives. Heal us. And you said that as often as we do this, we declare the Lord's death until he comes. I want you to think of that, church. We declare the Lord's death right now to every angel, every principality, every throne and dominion, to heaven, to every saint, and to the Lord himself. We say Jesus died and rose again. And so this morning we receive the body of the Lord Jesus Christ as your family, Jesus. Amen. Receive. And for those of you who came forward, let the Lord nourish you with communion. Nourish you with his body and blood. Protect you. Jesus said, this is the cup of the new covenant. In my blood, shed for the remission of sin. And Lord, let the power of the blood do its work now. Cleanse us, heal us, forgive us, and protect us. Take our lives in Jesus' name. Receive Hallelujah. Just for about five seconds, just close your eyes and thank Him. Just begin to love on Him. Just begin to love on Him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Now, before you leave, I just want to pray this blessing. Father in heaven, clothe your people. Clothe me. Clothe us all in your manifest presence. I declare a blessing over you that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, that you've been known before you were ever formed in your mother's womb, and that today you come out through this covenant meal. You come out of Egypt, the land of bondage, the land of slavery, the land of limitation. Let the power of the covenant crack open and flow through their lives. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your patience. I love you all. Can we give the Lord praise? Let's give the Lord praise. Thank you, Father. We'll see you tonight. Michael and Jess here. We are standing in the exact location where the headquarters for Jesus Image will be. Local church, Jesus School, uh, House of Bethany, all of that will be located right here. In fact, in the exact spot where Jesse and I are standing will be the beautiful pond in front of the sanctuary where we will most likely be holding baptism services occasionally. So we're so excited. We're right here in Seminole County off of Lake Mary Boulevard. We own this land. God owns this land, I should say. And the building will be right behind us. The sanctuary, the admin building, and the prayer house. And so listen, we just want to say thank you so much. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for giving. Thank you for praying. Thank you for being so patient and believing with us. We're believing God that the nations will descend on this property, that they will worship Jesus, that the sick will be healed here, that the lost will be saved, that the presence and glory of God will rest here. We want that. We believe this is holy ground and that the tangible glory of Jesus will be right here on this land. And so we want to invite you to come and invite you to be a part of what God is going to do here. 
Yeah, we are just so very thankful for you. Thank you so much for your prayers and your love and support. We are truly blown away with what the Lord is doing and we cannot wait to have you here with us one day. Yeah, and we're really excited about what we're gonna show you right now. We wanna take you on a journey and show you the incredible design, detail, and vision of what will take place on this property. Our Jesus Image home will be located in the beautiful Seminole County right off of Lake Mary Boulevard. This is a thriving area filled with families, restaurants, and the beautiful amenities that this area provides. The vision of this property is simple. We want the presence of Jesus Christ to be known. We have a deep value for experiencing the Lord in His beauty and the majesty of His creation. This facility will host our local church family, Jesus School, which is our discipleship training program yearly conferences, the Bethany House of Prayer, and it will also be an outreach hub for the state and nation. There is vision behind everything. The location of the buildings, the landscaping, the water features, and of course the architectural design of the buildings themselves all speak to the beauty of the Lord. We want all who enter the property to feel as though they've entered into the peace of the presence of God. With all the stress and turmoil that people face on a daily basis, this will be a place of serenity, worship, reflection, and adoration. Rather than this feeling like a headquarters, we want this to be the house of God and a home for His people. You will notice that the structures themselves have a timeless look and design. From the stonework to the stained glass, it will feel like the house of God. The gospel will be declared from every side of the property in multiple different ways. As you pull into the new Jesus Image home, you will discover a massive parking area that will be framed by and filled with beautiful shrubbery and trees. There will be plenty of room for you and your family. A beautiful drive leads you to the sanctuary building. You will enter through a stone archway. Upon the archway, one of the foundational verses for Jesus' image will be inscribed. This verse carries the heartbeat of our lives and the construction of this house. Only one thing is needed, Luke 10, 42. Upon entering the front door to the main building, you will see a massive gathering area. It is a two-story structure. The first level will be filled with life. This will be a place to congregate with friends and family, to get your children checked into children's church, to eat, or simply enjoy a coffee around a beautiful fireplace. The first level will also house the youth room. We have a major focus on seeing this next generation love Jesus. The youth room will seat approximately 500 people. This room will also serve as the second year facility for Jesus School. Our children's rooms will be located on the first level. This will be a convenient experience for children and parents upon their arrival. Our children will receive amazing Bible teaching, a worship experience, and knowledge of the presence of the Holy Spirit for themselves. The second level of the main building will facilitate working spaces for our board of directors, our staff, and interns. This will be a great blessing for us as we move forward in wisdom as a ministry. As you know, God has graced Jesus' image with a massive reach through media. Thousands have come to Jesus, and so many have been healed and set free through our media ministry. We will have our very own production studio where we can create content and continue to stream live to the nations. We will release podcasts, social media content, videos, and much more. Multiplied millions have watched our media content, and we believe our creative team will flourish in this new space as they step out into this vital and anointed calling. As you walk across the main gathering space, you will discover the sanctuary. What an amazing space this will be. While we will have state-of-the-art technology in the sanctuary, the space will take you back in time, a time when churches had a sacred feel to them. You will discover beautiful stained glass behind the platform. Stained glass will line the sides of the sanctuary as well, all telling the gospel story of Jesus. There will be timeless wood beaming and stonework throughout. 
We long for his presence to fill this place, and it will be a home for you as well. We will seat approximately 1,500 people, yet it will not lose the personal feel that we so deeply value. The platform will be spacious, with plenty of room for ministry, our worship teams, and of course, a baptismal. You will notice a round stained glass image on the back wall of the sanctuary, depicting a dove in fire descending in the room. May the Holy Spirit fill our hearts each time we gather as a church family. The sanctuary space will also serve Jesus School. This will house our hundreds of first year students as well as our general school sessions. These students will be missionaries to the nations of the world and to their generation. The gospel will be declared from this sanctuary space multiple times per week and people will be raised up from this place to share Jesus with the world. And may millions be saved, healed, and touched by the Holy Spirit. Lastly, for our favorite space on the property, the Bethany House of Prayer. This will be the prayer house for Jesus' image. It will be a place for adoration, silent prayer, reflecting upon the scriptures, and worship. You will notice that the house will be built upon a pond. The setting will be quaint and breathtaking. Stone and wood mark the space with warmth and a traditional look that we believe will transcend generations. We believe this will be the hub of the entire property, a place where intimacy with God and pure prayer ascend before Him. It is named the Bethany House because Bethany was the place where Jesus was loved deeply. Therefore, He rested there. Mary found the better part, and it is our prayer that all who enter will find Jesus there and fall in love with Him. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May He be adored and worshiped on this property. May His Word be taught with clarity, boldness, and love. May His gospel flood the nations, and may the generations to come find Him here. Will you stand with us? Will you pray and give toward this vision? Will you give sacrificially for the sake of Jesus and his gospel? Will you be a part of something that will outlive you for the sake of eternity? Thank you. We love you. Jesus is beautiful.